Charlie coming to you live from Los Angeles, California to show you how to make all these dollar dollar bills, y'all. Those are, those are ones. There's at least five of them. <laughs> Happy Saturday, everybody. We moved our lives to Saturday because, you know, football. Uh, but all right, calm down. <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody, to the group. We got, what, a couple of hundred uh, new people this week, which is fantastic. Uh, some of them, uh, just you guys keep coming out of everywhere. Uh, so I wanted to touch base with some simple things here real quick because uh, I was helping somebody do the Patreon yesterday, and I realized that not everybody knows how to use it. So let me help you out. If you're in the group. When you get to the group, we welcome you with the message that says, hey, thank you for coming. Here's the Patreon. I've mentioned it a lot. Inside the Patreon, we have a bunch of eBooks as well as a catalog of every single live that we've done. And it's searchable. And you can go in by everything that you want to look at. So you can just type in there and find anything. And it'll bring you back to uh, all of our videos here. And um, what I'd like to also say with that is um, that the uh, – Patreon also has a Slack channel on it uh, that, that you can pay for where it is a one-on-one -on -one forum uh, for you, or to me, or to a few other big uh, advertisers in there. And there's a bunch of ebooks from conferences and, and, and uh, you know, decks from, from representatives, all, all sorts of stuff. There's a ton of things. So um, it's definitely great. And also people are sharing very personally. That's, that's where you can like – screenshot your actual ads and your, your media spends and we can do a bunch of analysis also that we have one-on-ones here uh in in this group so that if you want to have just a straight on convo we can do that uh a lot of the one-on-ones we build what we like to call the scrum doc which is our cross-platform tracker to understand all performance across the entire funnel for every account so um if any of that is something you need just go to the slack channel or go to the patreon and check it out. I'll, I'll I'll drop a link here again inside of the uh, description of this video. So it, it's really the best use of the buck, uh, best use for your dollar. And um, I, you know, I, I've been seeing more and more people uh, charging hundreds and hundreds of dollars for stuff like that, and it's just a fucking waste. So um, get in there. I think it's like thirty bucks. So give it a shot. Mm. We were joined this morning by Ali of Pilates Punks. That's me. Pilates punks. There you go. Uh, yeah. So anyway, um, I just want to get right into it because I got a big day today. And um, so let's get into every week we do. We start off with telling everybody about the group. Then we get into the homework for the week. And if you do any of the homework, you can get into the Patreon or the Slack or get a one-on-one -on -one call for 50% off, which is fantastic. Or you get any ebook you want for free. So it's a really, really great way to maximize um, all the opportunities and all the resources we have here for the lowest price, which honestly, I'm already probably charging way too little, but uh, that's because we have a whole, you know, uh, undermine the gurus thing here. So I'm not going to charge a shit ton of money when I'm telling you the people are charging way too much fucking money. The difference is what we're teaching here, um, they're going to implement over the next, you know, couple months and then do a case study and then lie about the results and then sell it to you six to nine months later. Because remember, um, they're not, pra they're not executioners. They're people, they're salesmen. Right, and you can't trust a salesman. So anyway, um, let's get into it. Um, this week, uh, the homework. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to pull up my notes here. Okay, great. Uh, the homework for this week is. Um, so by the way, we do all that stuff, and then we get into the lessons for this week and answer all of your questions, and we'll address the poll for the week and any of the posts that went live for any sexy tips and tricks. So the homework for the last month or so has been to take anything that we've posted and drop into any other groups. And more than a few of you have done that, and I thank you very, very much. But this week, I want to get into something more more executional for a lot of people. Um, when, what I want to talk about today is the targeting audiences and um, how to use your existing database, because this will go into a question that we have later. Um, and, and using the most amount of resources that you have. A lot of people, including myself, 
will have taught to retarget at the bottom of the funnel, which I'm absolutely a big fan of. We call this bottom of funnel retargeting. This is like add to cart, some view contents from the last day or the last week. But one of the biggest resources that people don't use is long tail site traffic and, and ad engagers. I, I've, I think I've had it maybe at least half a dozen conversations in the last week with people about ad engagers, post and ad engagers. This is a custom audience inside of Facebook where it pools everybody that is liked, commented, shared, uh, joined a group, uh, viewed a video, anything. Hey, Jake, how you doing? Um, so these ad engager audiences are really, really powerful because they're essentially people that know who you are. You know that they've actually seen you. You know that they've actually taken an action on something that you've done. So these are folks who are warm, they're called you know, warm leads if you want. We would call this a mid-funnel audience. For a lot of brands that have other things going on, maybe they've got an influencer game happening or they've got a big YouTube thing happening or very strong organic something going on or maybe they've got tap joy happening, which we've been talking to you about, or Instagram growth hacking and you know that there are people engaging with you but you don't really want to spend money just prospecting out to the, to the cold world. You can go back on an, a post or ad engager back one year. So my homework for you guys today is to create a post and ad engager audience for the last 365 days. Just create the audience and then, um, yeah, send a screenshot to me and I'll give you, like I said, 50% off this Patreon, the Slack, uh, an, a one-on-one -on -one phone call or any ebook for free. Now, again, this is a great audience if you're a small business. This is a wonderful audience. So say you're a restaurant or you know, you're a Pilates studio or anything else. You can make both Facebook and Instagram ad engager audiences. And this is a really, really great way of Mac of combining both retargeting, which is something we want, which is a very qualified and narrow focused um, audience, but doing it to the biggest audience that we can, which is we know. Facebook likes to see really big audiences because you pay a premium on your CPM for the smaller the audience, the higher you pay to reach them. So how do you reach the largest, most qualified audience? That's how you get to post and ad engagers and site traffic. So site traffic like the last six months, but we're not gonna get there today. All we're gonna do is the Facebook ad engager audience. So again, this is better than a video viewer audience because it has all the video viewers in it and you don't have to make one for every single video that you're posting. This is better than, you know, than, than other, other things. What I like about this is this is basically anybody that has shown an interest in you. They've, they've liked, commented, or shared, or viewed videos, or any action possible on your Facebook page or Instagram account. And most people don't even really bother with the Instagram account, but that can be huge, especially for small businesses or models or actors or entertainers or personalities. Like, the, If you have a business where you're active on all the platforms, don't leave these leads on the table because they're far better than cold traffic. I guarantee you that. Right now, how much better they are, I'm, I can't tell you, but they're phenomenal audiences that are really, really solid for both DR and brand awareness and to try to take action. So highly recommend it. Um, one of the great advantages of this audience is Facebook in the bid to see how much they're gonna charge you. They look at your budget and they look at the estimated action rate. How likely is somebody to take an action off of what you've done? When you're retargeting somebody that has already taken an action, that estimated action rate is higher. So the estimated action rate is on the bottom of the fraction, the budget's on the top of the fraction. The higher the likelihood of somebody taking an action, the cheaper it is to reach them. If that person's already taken an action, or five, or 10, then it's much more likely that they're gonna take an action, which means you pay a much lower price to reach them. This is a beautiful thing, right? So. Ad engager audience, oh, I call it an ad engager, it's post and ad engager audience, 365 days. Make it, send me a screenshot, you get a bunch of free shit. That's what it's all about, right? That's what we're getting into this week. So that's the homework, get that done, you get any of the eBooks, um, or uh, half off a of Patreon, half off the Slack, or half off a one-on-one -on -one call, um, and, and, and the, you know, the Scrum Doc build. So anything we can do for you, Let's take a look at it. Uh, great. One of the things that I did want to revisit 
and we mentioned it once or twice before we get into some of the questions for this week, is the Scrum Doc build. Um, this is something that um, I mention a lot and I talk a lot and anybody that ever works with me knows that this is like the first thing that I do. There's an ebook in the Patreon, it's called the Scrum Doc. This is probably the best way, it's the best way I've ever come across, of tracking all your performance across all of your channels in a way that is way more telling than what the Facebook or Google or any dashboard. And the value of it is it shows all of the performance across the same metric side by side. I highly, highly recommend you all take a look at it. And um, I'm going to be working on trying to, with the people in the Slack, I'm going to um, make a couple of scrum docs with them for free and to get some video examples. And then if you join the Slack, you can see how they're done and see how they're used and really try to take some of that uh, content in there and, and, and make sure that you guys actually really understand not only the value, but also how to execute. Because I realized the eBooks, if you know what you're looking at, they make total sense. If you don't, they can be very overwhelming and there's a shit ton of stuff in there. So anyway, take a look at it, join the Patreon, do the homework, get in there for free. Um, and we'll go from there. All right. So what I want to get into today, um, was a question from court, great community member. I've known him for years now. We've done some business together. Also a fucking Shopify wizard. Amber, you're new to the group. Uh, I was talking with Jeff, uh, and, and, um, this is the guy. This is the guy for your Shopify dev needs. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Anyway, um, Court asks a very great question. So I'm going to read this off, and then we're going to walk through. And the reason I think this is valuable is Court's basically doing an end-of-the-year sale where he wants to set up a promotion. He's got a spend level. He's doing a pretty sizable budget. And this is, you know, it works for large budgets and small budgets. Um, but what is the strategy that I would give him and how to use this? Now, I could do this in comments, but I felt like this would be a phenomenal example of here's a Q4 sale or a holiday sale or something. Let me walk through top, step number one to the very end, top to bottom, on how to execute this. So anyway, court's question. Let's see if we can get this. Come on. What's going on here? Come on. Hey puppy. All right. Court's question. If I have a massive, I have a massive sale approaching in a week. It's up to 70% off. It's supposed to be the biggest sale of the year for my brand. Should I focus a major part of my spend right now? Just running top of funnel campaigns, optimizing for add to cart review content. Should I optimize for purchase? My thoughts are spend 10K on top of funnel and lose pretty hard for the week, but hammer 70% of the retargeting during the sale and hit all retargeting efforts hard. I was also going to run a pre sale video over a video view campaigning, and everybody's engaged in my brand all the time. Post engage your audience, love it. Um, scale that up to hit everyone and then run a video view retargeting with the offers during the sale. Thoughts? Curious on how I would approach it. Love to hit a home run here. Uh, Court, by the way, is a great success story. He was like, mm, you can bother him about that stuff. Great fucking resource. So anyway, wonderful question here. He's got a pretty sizable budget for the brand that he's working on or his brand. Um, and he wants to build up a, get a sale going. So he's asking, do we spend heavy before the sale and then hammer home during the sale? And, and, you know, a lot of times I see a lot of advertisers spend a lot of money doing this. So let me walk you through what is the old school way of doing it, what is the most common way of doing it, and then what is the way I would do it, right? So let's just kind of give some clarity to everything. So the old school way of doing this is announcing the sale like a month in advance and saying like, hey, everybody, this thing is going to happen. Get ready for it, um, which is you know, really great because it gets you brand awareness, it gets people hyped, and then when you're running the sale, you know that you've got a bunch of qualified individuals. And this goes back to, you know, television or anything else where they would send out mailers and do all those things like, you know, uh, the 4th of July sales coming up, right? Or, or you see it a lot like car ads or mattresses or any of those things. So that's the old school way of doing it. Now, 
Hey, Amber, how you doing? I just, um, we're answering a question right now, actually, Amber, from um, Court, about how to do uh, end of your sales. By the way, this is your man, Amber. You can rewatch this and you check us out. Um, but, so the old school way of doing this is, like I said, announcing it ahead of time and really hammering home the messaging. And then you don't really do, a, and then you do a lot of uh, reminder messaging, right? Um, during the sale to get people in. The digital version of that, which is what most people do, is like he's saying, let me, I suppose I focus a large part of my spend right now optimizing for top of funnel campaigns for add to carts and view content. Pushing people at the top of the funnel and then retargeting them during the sale. So what he's basically saying is, and this is a very common thing. Let me drive a bunch of people to my site. Let me get them all in my retargeting pools. And then during the sale, I can hammer them all home. While I think that this is a good strategy, and it's really, really common, what it does is, is it takes a lot of the money that you have to make a sale, and it pushes it towards not actually selling something during the sale. If you're telling a lot of people, hey, uh, if you spend a lot of money right now to tell people I'm going to save you a lot of money in like a week, then what you're effectively doing is telling them all, hey, I'm an advertiser. Don't buy from me. Wait. Now, most people, uh, one, won't wait. Two, don't care. Three, if you get them excited about a product, they're going to do research on the product. And you effectively do some nice bit of um, – uh, nice bit of promo. Hey, Court, how you doing, man? We're addressing your question right now. Uh, so I, we were actually on step two right now, Court, where we're saying uh, number one is the old school way of doing it with television and mailers. Number two is the methodology that you were saying, and, and I know that Dylan's used it too, um, where you send out a lot of because where you send out a lot of information to people saying, hey, we got a sale coming up. Check this thing out. You fill your retargeting pools, and then during the sale, you hammer everybody home. Um, now, this is a really common thing. I've seen the guys from Common Thread Collective do it. I know that Eric Dyke, put, uh, not, not Eric Dyke, I know Nick Shackelford pushes it. I know that Tim Bird pushes it. A lot of these guys push it because it makes your numbers look really good. So let me tell you what I would do, and let me first shoot punch holes in their theories. So number one is you're advertising to people to tell them don't buy right now, which means that's a dollar not spent on making a sale. Number two. The reason that this is taught and the reason that this is shown heavily by guru types is because you can get a very high lift on the initial th the initial campaign. What a lot of the people will do is have um, an ad account that says um, one ad account for promo, right? And it says, here's everything, right? And they show you the results of that promo ad account. And it's like a 28-day thing, right? Where it's saying, oh, we hit this thing in our, you know, on uh, you, we have a July 4th sale. So the last week in June, we put out all these things and it got like a 5X ROI. That's a 5X ROI or a 20X ROI or whatever fucking bullshit number they're giving you. It's generally on a 28-day click, one-day view metric, sometimes even more, uh, we'll say um, completely full of shit than that. And, and what they're doing is they're basically saying, we're filling this up and then we're retargeting these people and they're taking credit for this for the, the the return on ad spend money that they show here. Doesn't account for the spend that they're spending in retargeting. So if you spend 10,000 in promo and then you hit people back with another 10,000 in sales and you get uh, five ads or a two X on this number, you need to at least get 2x here before you even break even because you also spend that money up front. Now, a lot of times people get these ridiculously high numbers. And the honest truth is we know that they're taking credit for email. They're taking credit for Google. They're taking credit for all sorts of other channels plus organic traffic, which is um, absolute bullshit and, and, and really disingenuous. But we're not getting into one day post click or not numbers right now. So. Let's get to punching holes in that system. Number one, I don't want to pay people to tell them, hey, I'm having a sale, but don't buy from me right now. 
I don't want to spend money to promote a product and create a need for somebody and then tell them to not buy from me right now so that their immediate next step is to go to Google or Amazon and buy from a competitor and then ignore me in a week and a half when I try to hit them up for something because not only did I spend money to make my competitor a sale, I'm also filling my retargeting pools of people who have already made a purchase that aren't going to buy from me so they're a wasted impression when I spend money on them again. And number three, um, I, I, I don't like the idea of trying to preload retargeting audiences and then trying to retarget them later um, because you're losing all the level of intent. How many people here, raise your hand, all right, let's, let's present the magic of, of the internet. Raise your hand if you found out a sale was happening in a week and you waited uh, on hand and foot to buy that thing on some like product you can get on the internet, right? I, I've never fucking done it. The only time I'm ever waiting for a sale is like when concert tickets come out or like a movie theater, movie ticket, like something where I can only get it from one place where it's a unique experience and that's the only spot that I can do it and I'm getting a lot of messaging from other places plus an emotional attachment to the product or to the experience. If you're selling fucking cell phone cases or mattresses or jackets or jewelry or fucking dog food. No one gives a shit about your product, right? Like, yes, they're excited about it, but they don't care nearly as much as like, you know, the next Harry Potter movie or like their favorite band coming to town. That's an emotional attachment with a large marketing budget and years set up where somebody's just waiting for the opportunity to get that thing. Whatever you have, 99% of the time isn't going to be nearly that valuable. So you're basically saying, hey, I've got, let me present to you uh, an issue. Let me present you a problem. Let me present you a solution. And let me present you my product. Um, regardless of whether or not you were saying that there was a sale in a week or not, if you give me all that stuff right now, I'm going to see you're at. I'm, I'm probably going to... You know, if it's a shirt, I might go to Amazon or, or, or Poshmark and try to get it used. Or, you know, if it's if it's any other thing, I'm going to try to find a cheap knockoff of it. And if it's the thing that I want that's really high end, if you save me 10% in a week or two, I've got a lot of time where you've got me excited about it, that you've got to keep me excited about it. Keeping me excited about it is fucking expensive. When I was running media for... CBS or Nissan or you know Activision or Levi's, they've got the budget to keep you excited the whole time. So what I would say is that strategy only really works if you've got sequential retargeting messages and you can dump a shit ton of money and you know that you've got a giant profit margin off of every product. So maybe you're running, you know, maybe in the beauty space, right, where uh, products cost like five bucks and you sell them for like a hundred or something where you've got the profit margin so that you can afford to spend $70 to turn somebody on and then you sell them the product in which case you could say well I gave somebody a click for five bucks and they bought something for a hundred dollars and you can show a hundred or twenty X ROI but we know that's bullshit because somebody was watching videos the whole time you spent seventy dollars to string them along and then you effectively you never know, made 20 bucks or something, but that's not a great profit margin. So, especially when you have infrastructure costs and everything else. So, how would I do it, right? This is the big lead up and then the prevail, right? And the reveal. I would, A, seed it with some organic stuff. I don't think there's something wrong saying, hey, big sale coming up. But I don't think that there's any reason to promote that with real dollars, right? Um, two, I they say A and then two, whatever. Um, I would definitely try to find, if it possible, user-generated contents and testimonials. Um, and this is, you know, something that is really strong. Uh, that type of content tends to work really well, especially for big sales. Because when things are on sale, people want to be excited about it. Few things excite people more than other people telling them how great something is. C. Um, I would definitely focus on getting the CRM list that you have as strong as possible for the sale. And this is again like running engagement. This is this is um, you know getting um, 
uh, opt to comment to opt in customer acquisition stuff on Facebook Messenger or getting a group or getting emails or lead gen or something so that you can blast it out. I think those are all really strong pieces. And I don't think that you need to spend money on those things. I think you can say, hey, we've got a great sale, but it's not worth everything else. Um, who's running before the sale, but that's the groundwork that you can lay. During the sale, day one, generally I find like if the sale starts on a Friday, Thursday night, actually turn the sale on and hammer home. You, you said you've got a video, right? To recap this thing. You say you've got uh, a video. We're going to run a pre-sale video over a video view campaign hitting everyone who's engaged with the brand all time. This is a solid concept. What you want to do is you're using this at post and ad engager 365 audience we talked about in the homework. Run your video to that audience. Run a comment to opt in chat bot growth engine on that video so that anybody that comments on it, specifically probably like tagging your friends and put some copy in there. It's like, hey, tell all your friends about this thing. It's only going to happen now. Blah 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 blah. And then when people comment. They're opted in, and then the Facebook Messenger chatbot can reach out to them and say, like, hey, here's your special code. Click on the site. It's going, there's a special, you know, pre sale, sale kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, like a flash sale before the actual sale. Um, and those things seed really, really well. So that's going to get you your awareness right right off the top. And I definitely love the idea of running a videos to these people. What I would say though is instead of running a video view objective against them, I would run a conversion objective so that you can try it. Facebook can focus on the people that are likely to make sales. And instead of running just a video view objective on a conversion objective, um, I would optimize for purchase. But maybe in that audience, because you're going after people that are Facebook posts and ad engagers, go after daily unique reach. You want to make sure that during the sale, if it's a week long, every single person in that audience has seen your shit at least once a day. You want to blast home that really warm audience as much as fucking possible. And that way also when other people come into your ecosystem for the sale, they're being repeated that messaging. And you can also say that people that have viewed that video can be excluded from that video so that if they've seen it once, then they comment, then they're in the chat bot. That can get a little rough. Maybe you do that on day three. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you can exclude people that maybe have watched it like 95% or something. Anyway. That's not really necessary, but if you want to get super fancy, that's about as fancy as I would get. Running that stuff at the very top of funnel is going to help. The other thing is I would turn on all I, – I wouldn't turn off your existing campaigns, but I would take the budgets that you have and shift them over to this sale campaign so that effectively what you're trying to do is take the audiences that you already have, the, the campaigns that you already have. I, you can even go so far as to – I would make new campaigns and run it, but you could take existing campaigns with all of the learning and the existing ad sets with all of that if you're being super cautious and run those up against um, with the sale promotion. Um, I would also take a uh, I would also take uh, if you're using dynamic ads and you're using a product catalog, make a specific product catalog for the sale. So it's like a you know say it's back to school sale. Make a specific product catalog that only features the items that are available in the back to school sale. Make a DPA ad specifically for that and run that against your very short and very long window DPA audiences. So your add to cart one days, your view content one days, and then also very long audiences. Add to cart six months, you know, purchase six months, view content six months, and add engagers to earn 65 days. Because this is a short sale, you're not nearly as interested in trying to convert people on a really high level of interest right now. What you want to do is maximize anybody that has ever shown interest in the brand because they're most likely to come to you again. You need to get as big a reach as possible and then let the rest of your other advertising do the work for you because your site should convert them. If it's a sale, the facet that 
the fact that you're running a sale and the facet of this of the the discounted prices and whatever else should convert somebody if that doesn't convert somebody let your other retargeting stuff run because those other retargeting efforts will convert somebody just fine they're they're already on they're already working no reason to mess with them so have your very bottom of funnel audience your add to cart one days your view contents your very bottom of funnel and run mid funnel for very long windows that way you get anybody that has had any level of intent for any purchase or awareness or anything and run all of that before you go after prospecting and honestly with that type of budget depending on the size of your audience and your existing customer base you should be able to sell a shit ton of people now you are going to have a um, objective of getting new customers. That's what a sale is for, right? As you're exi- right now, all we've done is really cover existing customers. So how do you turn this into customer acquisition and growth for your brand? This is where you take everybody that hasn't added the cart in the last six months, that hasn't engaged with you in the last 365 days, that hasn't been your site in the last six months, right? All of these mid funnel retargeting audiences are as big as fucking possible. This is where I would run very simply what we, our audiences for the creative testing member are stacked like look like 1% so of all buyers in the last six months and all buyers of a specific product and you know, uh, every, you know value-based lookalike. So it's people the most likely to spend the most money. You run that stack lookalike what would you normally do creative testing and then also a broad audience? So just, you know, age and or gender, um, auto placement so that you're running desktop and mobile with newsfeed, Instagram, all that stuff, anything, let Facebook do all the thinking there. And I would definitely, if you can run that on auto, do it. If you know that, your sales really focusing on a specific price point. Like for instance, you only sell one product, right? And it's a hundred dollar product that you need to sell for $75. I would run a manual bid campaign. Now I prefer cost cap, but I would run it at 10% over your, or 10 to 20% over your actual target, uh, your goal CPA. And what you're trying to do there is if you have both broad and lookalike audiences with this one ad that you've been running and retargeting to let everybody know that you've got something happening. The estimated action rate on that ad is going to be really high because you started running that ad only on warm leads, right? People that saw people that have engaged with you in the last 365 days or have abandoned cart recently, those retargeting audiences. Facebook will look at that as having a very high estimated action rate. That's the denominator on the bottom of the fraction. And because you're only, maybe you're pushing only 50, you're not, you're not pushing probably more than 50% of your budget to this audience because you really want to make profit on this sale while it's good for customer acquisition. At the end of the day, in six months, when somebody looks at the numbers on a sheet of paper, they're not going to care that this 10,000 was spent one place and that 10,000 was spent somewhere else. The profitability of the company is going to rely on making sales. So many companies fuck this up. Like, well, we need all new customers. Existing customers will buy. If your existing company, customers will buy, they would have bought on the email announcement to begin with, and they will be excluded because you should exclude buyers over the course of the sale. If you're only using 50% or less of your money on this actual prospecting audience, that means that you're spending a shit ton of it on an audience that has a very high likelihood to take an action. So your estimated action rate is going to be high and your numerator, your actual budget is going to be pretty low. Um, relatively speaking, like if you have a $10,000 budget, instead of spending 88,000 up here on a, let's say, I mean, this is terrible math, but let's just say it's 8,000 up here and your estimated action rates are five, right? That's going to be, you know, a very, that's going to be a number much, much higher than $5,000 budget up here with an estimated action rate of a 10, right? It's a very different bit. Um, and that's what you need to think about all of this stuff. So in addition to that, 
what I would recommend is if you can, if you have the time and you're willing to have the complexity in place, I would run a target cost and a cost cap and an auto bid, where the auto bid is maybe like 30% of your prospecting budget, 40%, and then you've got the auto, you've got the manual bid taking the bulk, but so maybe 40 in cost cap, 40 in bid, and uh, in, in, in um, bid cap, and then like 20% in auto. Um, that's gonna be something that lets you make sure that if your manual bids don't work, that you got something else that's gonna float your volume for the sale. Now this is, means that you're gonna have to stay on top of the budgets every day, but that's okay, right? And, and you're gonna have to make sure that you are um, really on top of your numbers, but effectively what you're doing is you're trying to have the manual bid drive as efficient, drive traffic from the top of the funnel as efficiently as possible. And in, in the top of the funnel stuff, you're running a conversion campaign to a purchase objective, optimizing to conversions. In the mid funnel, you're running a reach object, a daily unique reach objective to a purchase, um, no, we'll purchase objective, optimizing for a daily unique reach against your really warm audiences. And then the bottom of the funnel, you're running conversion campaigns for the purchase objective with, you know, optimizing for conversions. So really what you're doing is you're saying anybody up top who I think is going to buy at my target CPA will run every dollar that you can. In the mid funnel, make sure everybody that could possibly have an interest in this that would be like in my email audience or something else, let them make sure every single person in that audience sees it. And then at the bottom, every single person that has shown an interest in buying but has abandoned their journey, make sure that you run home as much media on the converters there as possible. Uh, I would put in engaged shoppers on the on the upper funnel to make sure that you are focusing on people that Facebook says are most likely to make a purchase. And the combination thereof is going to get you three levers essentially to optimize for most amount of volume of spend and most amount of profitability. Um, those are the ways to really set it up. Now, effectively what you're looking at, the auto, or low, I guess it's lowest cost, the auto bid campaign in prospecting is your slush fund for every dollar that isn't spent in the bottom and mid funnel um, manual bids. Say, for instance, you need to spend $1,000 a day, right? And, and we're using everybody $1,000 a day because the court has told us that his budget's 10 to 20K. And it's probably a week long, so we're just going to keep simple math. Let's say it's $1,000 a day. Let's say the manual bid in all of the retargeting can only spend 700 bucks. Well, then your auto can take in the rest. And you're going to have to adjust that auto on more or less a daily basis. Looking at the delivery that you had before, I wouldn't do it intraday. Don't worry about that shit. Like, you just need to know roughly you need to pace to a certain spend level every day let that auto bid get you roughly to that pacing level. Um, I, what? I don't know, I'm doing the thing. You can use the blender. You do use the blender. I, I don't understand the hand signals when I'm on a, when I'm on a, when I'm on a This means something. I just don't know what that means. Anyway, <laughs> I'm doing a thing. It's gonna take longer. Can you make me one too? Sure. Thank you. So anyway, uh, so anyway, that's that's effectively what you want to do. You know, so if you identify your defined daily pace, let the auto bid be your slush fund, so you can keep that level of volume. You're gonna be able to find that there's a daily budget switch throughout the. You, there's a daily budget fluctuation throughout your entire campaign. Hopefully, what ends up happening is your manual bid campaigns take a larger and larger portion of the budget as they learn who a good buyer is and maybe have to pump up or down your bids to make sure that you're getting enough volume. Your bottom of funnel campaigns grow in spend because you're driving a bunch of traffic and your mid funnel campaigns kind of peter out because it's more effective for you to spend money in the top or the bottom of the funnel, but you're making sure that you're maximizing how your dollars are spent over the entire sale. So, um, I know that that's a bit more complex than say run a video view campaign to retarget everybody with a sale, but you are going to be able to maximize for efficiency, 
for volume and for profitability. And those are the levers that you're going to have. Remember, efficiency is going to come effectively from your mid funnel audience because you're going to be able to determine how much you want to spend there versus in prospecting. Your profit is going to come from the bottom funnel audience, which you're using, um, you know, your add to cards and your view contents and all of that stuff. And you're using DPA as well as your sale ads um, so that you can really adjust what the right product offerings are for that person. And I would say while there's DPA is solid, some people don't understand the carousel um, inside of a DPA. So make sure that you run both a DPA and your you know, awareness or whatever, your sale ad. Um, and then uh, on the top of the funnel is where you're getting all your volume. So you can really adjust those levers to make the most out of your sale. Um, now the reason that uh, folks that speak on conferences, uh, speak at conferences and, and, and you know sell you courses aren't gonna explain that is because it's way more complex than hey, run this thing and then do this thing and then here's a bullshit number. But um, for somebody that doesn't speak at conferences, it just gets paid to actually make a shit ton of money for people, um, that's the way I would do it. And for the record, that's the way I, I have run several million dollars in media to come up with that strategy. And so far it hasn't failed me once. It's actually effective enough that I have been able to run those ads after the sale ended. Well, we were just like, whoa, it's still working. Even though people are clicking on the on the Labor Day sale or the you know New Year's sale and the sale's over, it's effective enough where people click and they're just like, all right, fuck it, I'll buy. Because a lot of times people will see the thing, if you have specific products that are for sale, um, but the ad is effective enough in creating intent, people might want to buy a product that's not even in the sale, uh, but they'll still make a purchase. So you're getting enough interest into the brand so it actually runs after the sale and because of the efficiency of the way that you're running the campaign, um, you're creating a lot of, uh, you, the long tail effect is you uh, have a really high, uh, you have a really high quality retargeting audience and buyers, um, so the long tail retention efforts as well as the efficiency of your ad campaign because your estimated action rate will skyrocket during this helps your brand for days or weeks or months afterwards which is way more important than effectively saying, hey, we got a huge sale on a product, here's the thing. Um, so I know that that's a pretty in-depth strategy, but that's why I wanted to do it on video instead of a comment section, um, because uh, as somebody that's run these types of sales for million dollar brands and people that can spend 500 bucks a month, um, this is the number one way of doing it. And you can do it for $1,000 a day or you can do it for $100 a day. You can do it for, I don't know that you can do it for $10 a day, but the strategy still works, right? And where for advertisers with less money that don't have the luxury of ten dollars or $20,000 to spend over a week like Court does, um, I mean, the people like me that are spending twenty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a day, but if you only have, say, $1,000 a month or $500 a month, really focus on the mid-funnel audiences. Consider those your prospecting audiences. You don't need to spend money against broad or lookalike until you've maximized those audiences. And you'll be able to know that you've maximized them by doing a breakdown by day in your reporting, knowing that your frequency is over a two and that you're no longer able to spend money until them at the desired profit margin. Then you can go after new strangers. But until then, don't even worry about it. Your mid-funnel, Post and ad engage your 365 day audience can be your prospecting pool. And it's something that you really should try to take advantage of. So there you go. All right. Mm. Thank God for coffee. Um, before we go, by the way, there's a bunch of people in here. So thank you everybody. Lloyd and Chris and Mitchell and Sonia and Robert and Vanessa, thank you guys. I, I was so much on a little thing there, I didn't see y'all coming in. Um, I did have a couple of tips and tricks this week, so I wanted to kind of go over those a little bit here before wrapping up. So hopefully um, there's some more sense made to the post, but we'll start with the poll. So the poll this week was, 
how active are you on other platforms and why not more? So the number one answer here was I'm only active in outside of Facebook. I'm active on Google only and I don't know how the others work. Google only and I've tried the others and they don't work. Um, and, and people saying I would if I knew how. So um, what I'd like to get into really here is I'm not going to get into so much of how to execute all of these things, but I think um, based on some feedback that I've gotten from Slack and, and some other people is I'm going to show you guys in the next ebook. Um, I was writing something for the undermining the guru section, but I feel like these chats are way more up to date. And the honest truth is those gurus are going to be changing whatever bullshit sales, whatever get rich quick scheme that they're pitching more often than I'm going to update that ebook to keep up with them. So I'm going to pivot and you always got to be able to do that like water, right? So I'm going to get into here and um, show you guys some other stuff. So uh, we're going to go over the next ebook, which I promised to get you guys. We're going to go over Snapchat. We're going to go over Pinterest. We're going to go over Google stuff with screenshots on how to set up the campaigns and how to um, at least get going. And we're going to start with the mid and bottom funnel pieces. We're not going to prospect on them. We're going to use them for retargeting. And we're going to let all these other channels make money before you start reaching new people. And that's the number one thing that you want to set up whenever you're setting up on any platform, almost any platform, is how do I use this to maximize the money that's all the awareness that's already coming in? And a lot of people say, well, how do I get awareness of the brand? And that's where, you know, we, we've talked a lot about how to do growth hacking on Instagram and how to use TapJoy and a bunch of other tools to so create awareness. But before we want to create more awareness, we want to make sure that the people that are in the store are spending as much money as possible so that we have profit to go after new customers. Because the only way you make us, make, the only way you grow a company is by taking your profit margin and using it to grow. If you just try to grow without taking advantage of the sales that you already have leaving on the table, um, you're just going to spend a shit ton of money and then go broke. Um, so you need a quality salesman before you try to bring in a bunch of new customers. Anyway, wanted to go after a couple of things here real quick. Before we jump off, um, there were uh, two of the sexy tips this week that uh, – got comments, so I wanted to cover those in person. Uh, number one was social proof. So we all hear about, a lot about seasoning a pixel, which you guys may have heard me before say is absolute garbage and bullshit. But what has a real impact on ads is social proof. This is likes, comments, and shares on your ads. Often I see a ton of ads in an account with very few engagements, and what did I say? And uh, a struggle bus uh, full of new ads that may or may not perform well. The simple fact is new ads will perform worse than those with the tons of positive engagement. Um, they might not perform worse the first day, but by day three or four, the ones that have been running for a long time that have a high estimated action rate are going to perform better than the ones that Facebook doesn't know. Because remember, the estimated action rate is the number on the bottom of the fraction and the budget is the number on the top of the fraction, and that's how much Facebook is going to charge you to make whatever you're optimizing towards, whether it's a video view or a sale, right? So you have to know those two numbers is the simplest way of adjusting for your bids. Um, uh, let's see. Now, not only will a user be more receptive to an ad with lots of happy comments, but Facebook will also deliver ads for cheaper if they have positive sentiment. This is estimated action rate. Um, so the takeaway from this is use post IDs to centralize all your traffic to one iteration of each ad. What this means is now Facebook will automatically do this for you now when you get duplicate, but often, very often I see brands running the same ad from a bunch of different places, but it's actually different URLs. We want to make sure that we're running the exact same ad in every ad set. So the ad that you're running in the ad to cart one day is the same that you're running to the broad audience. If the ad is the same, it's the same uh, copy and the same creative and everything, make sure that it's running from the same Facebook post so that when Facebook's looking at that estimated action rate, it's taking all the people that are buying right away off the ad to cart one day that are super responsive 
and letting that inform the bid on the broad so that you make your prospecting more efficient. And it doesn't hurt your bottom line because the add to cart people are likely to buy anyway. So make sure that you're doing that. Plus it centralizes all of the learnings because Facebook has told us repeatedly that the learnings happen at the ad level. The learnings happen at the ad level. The ad sets learn how to use all of the ads within the ad set and the campaign inside of CBO understands how to adjust budgets across all of the ad sets. But the, all of the learnings, the actual learnings happen at the ad level. So the ads essentially are your sales pitches. The ad sets are your uh, like sales people, right? Your salesmen, sales ladies. And then the campaign is like the manager saying which salesperson should go after the sale. So the campaign is the manager understanding, say, oh, this is the right salesperson for the job. And then that salesperson says, this is the right sales pitch for the job. But they learn that that sales pitch works all the time because they're using the exact same sales pitch. This is the exact same thing you want to do on Facebook where every ad is you're using the same post. Even if it's identical, if it's not the same post, you're spending money to effectively make your campaigns worse. Two, monitor the comments section and keep things happy. Delete anything that's not positive. And if people have questions or if people are, you know, have less than positive sentiment, direct message them. Um, and then delete the ad. Use this for your customer service, but as long Facebook will hold ads, will hold negative feedback against you. Um, when people X out so or leave saying this is a scam, whatever, that will hurt your ability to perform effectively. So what I'd like to do is go in, comment saying, hey, this is a thing, we're going to message you. So that Facebook sees that engagement and then delete the comment and, and have the conversation offline so that that post is getting actions. But And then you're also deleting the negative feedback so it's positive sentiment and you're using your direct messaging to drive the highest customer engagement so that you can, or the kind of, uh, customer service so that you can close the loop on that sale. Um, and last, uh, remember that first touch ads should have a great first impression. So the effective, effectively what you're trying to do is say when somebody sees your ad for the first time, it should be hundreds of comments that are really positive and a lot of reactions and all that kind of stuff. Um, sadly, Instagram doesn't perform the same function uh, as Facebook. You can't use the same Instagram post in, in multiple ad sets, but that's okay. Um, and uh, what I like to do is I have an active, I have a active Google Doc. I have a Google Doc that is uh, actively updated of all the ads that are currently running, so that I can show somebody who's my customer service person or anything else. Here are all of the ads that we're running. You can go into them and I literally will do the name of the ad and then the URL of the ad and then like the last date checked in any notes so that I can see, hey, if this ad is doing poorly, is it because Facebook isn't doing well because somebody hasn't checked the comment section in two days? I guarantee you, and this happens to me, this used to happen to me all the time before I did this, is that I would turn off good ads that were really effective because they hit a target. We, we tried a targeting audience and that audience was not receptive to it and they like left bad comments. Um, and so it just tanked the performance because the estimated action rate and the, and the uh, sentiment on that ad was really negative. Um, and as soon as we cleaned it up, performance shot up overnight. The person cleaning up the ads will have a very direct um, effect on the profitability of that campaign. As much optimization as you do as a media buyer, the person running the ads and, and, and um, monitoring the comments section also improves it. And, and I've seen overnight like 30 to 50% improvement of ads just from doing that. So keep your eye on it. It's extraordinarily important. Um, and it's way more important to do that than to try to like season a pixel or optimize everything because uh, I don't know why I said optimize everything. Optimizing everything is very important. Uh, Facebook has said repeatedly that creative is king. That's what they're really focusing on because the creative is what sits inside somebody's newsfeed. 
Facebook wants people to enjoy Facebook when they're on Facebook. So if you, the worst targeting, well, I've, I've seen huge success with people just targeting broad, no retargeting, no nothing, just broad because the ad was really good. If your ad is really good and you're monitoring the comment section, it's all positive sentiments and high levels of, you know, comments and likes and shares and whatnot, you will almost assuredly beat out the best laid campaign architecture. It's just the matter of the way Facebook is nowadays and most other platforms are getting there as well. Um, Google is getting to be in that same space and they want people to enjoy their time on the platform and they'll reward that far more than they'll reward you for being really smart and having these really intricate uh, campaigns, which was the best practice two years ago. But remember, we've been going over simplified campaigns and centralizing all of the learnings around a few really good ads. So that's that. Um, and uh, we had a couple questions, but they're mainly around what do I mean by first touch ads? And what I mean by that is the first ad that somebody sees. And that's primarily inside of the prospecting campaigns. Um, let's see. Um, Court asks, have you run branded videos on Tapjoy? Absolutely, Court, do it all the time. You should absolutely do it. My, I, I don't do the interstitial video nearly as much as I'd like to um, because it's hard to prove out the profit margin later, but it's definitely something I'm getting into, especially with the new opportunity. And um, yeah, uh, branded video on Tapjoy is, is a great way of, Tapjoy is, is phenomenal driving that profit and a lot of interest in the brand, so it might be more effective there um, as than, than like a Facebook video campaign because you can actually get clicks that you can UTM and that you can use for inclusions and exclusions inside of audiences. Which brings us to the last piece of today, the sexy tactic on exclusions. This is something that I see tons of people um, not really taking advantage of. So, um, exclusions. I, I see your question, Court. We'll get to you in just a second. We'll wrap up with your question. Or we can do it offline. Actually, why not? Uh, how many offers do you have on an offer wall? Uh, Court, I run, um, I think I've had almost 10 at some point in time. So um, that's a really in the weeds question, uh, but I love it uh, on Tapjoy. I, I, I think half a dozen to a dozen is completely reasonable. Um, talk to our rep, Julia, and she'll really help you out. She's she's a fucking rock star. She's not gonna be a fucking rep to, for too long. She's gonna get some account executive level thing. We send her too much good business. Um, anyway, uh, exclusions. Often I see good basic exclusions allowing somebody to exist in only one stage of a funnel. But what I rarely see is exclusions create customer journeys. So if I'm retargeting a $59 card abandoner for 72 hours with a $139 offer and then dropping these users into a seven day 59 retargeting pool. So the point is, if somebody hits, we, we've talked a lot about um, trying to upsell people with retargeting is better than just hitting them with the discount because somebody might not buy on the first day. So if somebody has a, has a, you know, doesn't want to pay full price, offer them a buy to get one free um, because they can always come back and see that full price offer. But the buy to get one free might be like a, you know, a non-listed link on Google. So they need to see the ad to get to it or they'll save it or something. But what you're doing is you're saying, okay, this offer wasn't the right one for you. Let me give you more value. This is the uh, like infomercial style of solutions where you're saying, but wait, there's more, but wait, there's more until somebody buys. So while that will work, one of the ways of using exclusions is to say, if somebody sees the full price offer for three days, I'm gonna show them the buy to get one free. If they don't buy there, then I'll bring them back down to just seeing that basic offer because we still know that they might not have bought right away, but it's much better to do that than to just give them straight up day two, free shipping, day three, 50% off, um, which isn't necessarily something that you don't wanna do, but the way to use ex 
exclusions can be used to create these customer journeys. And oftentimes what I see is people saying, well, I'm going to exclude purchasers from my retargeting and I'm going to exclude people in my retargeting from my prospecting and they call it a day. But if you, I will literally get out a sheet of paper and draw this stuff out where it says, if somebody hits this ad for three days, I'm going to retarget them with this, right? So, and then after that, I'm going to hit them back with something else. So what you can do is on offer on, um, your day, your, your third step, you can exclude people that have uh, been to that offer in the last three days. So you've got the full price offer and you're retargeting everybody on that full price offer um, with you know the full price offer again. But you're going to exclude people that have been there for the last three days because you're using that as your inclusion audience for a buy to get one free. So I know that's a little bit tricky. I'll, I'll try to say it one other way. Um, the site track, let's say we're doing add to cart, you've got a full price offer and you're retargeting the add to carts for seven days on that full price offer with the same ad, which you should absolutely be doing. No reason to discount because most people don't buy on the first click. 91% of people don't buy on the first click. So you've got your full price offer, add to cart seven day, retargeting them with the full price offer where your exclusion in there would typically just be people that have purchased in that timeline. What I'm suggesting here is use that exclusion, use the exclusion functionality to also exclude people that have added the cart in the last three days. So i am got my main offer, I'm retargeting people that have added the cart in the last seven days, but I'm excluding the people that have retargeted in only the last three because I have an audience of the people that have added the cart in the last three days is going to the buy to get one free. So my customer journey is they saw the first ad and they added to cart. Then the next step is add to cart three day on the full price offers to buy to get one free. Then the next step is full price offer add to cart seven days, excluding the add to cart three day. That that's I, I know that that's a little complex and and I try to get into it a bit more in the comment section there. Um, and this is definitely something I can walk you through in like a one on one or in the Slack. Um, but this kind of way of providing more value right away um, is fundamentally better at driving a higher AOV and a higher ROAS. Because most people, the default setting that most people use is, oh, I'm just going to add to cart seven days to the same offer. Or they'll say add to cart one day to the same offer, add to cart, and then, and then they'll go 50% off, and then they'll go free shipping. And effectively what happens is if I saw an ad on a Wednesday and I wasn't really ready to buy, by Thursday you're hitting me with the ad, by Friday you're saying, okay, well here's 50% off. Well, I wasn't gonna pay full price, I just didn't get to it yet. And then by Saturday, if I wake up on Saturday morning ready to buy, you're saying, hey, it's 50% off and free shipping. I didn't even get the chance to buy it for full price. So if it's a $50 product, um, you've effectively paid me money over that period of time or you've spent money as the advertiser to maybe you spent five bucks, um, five dollars to get the meet in the retargeting audience, five dollars on day Thursday where I ignored it, five dollars on Friday where I was like, okay, I'm gonna buy that tomorrow, and then five dollars on Saturday. That's twenty dollars that you're in, and you took a fifty dollar product down to twenty five, and you're paying me shipping. Say the shipping's ten bucks. Um, you've spent thirty dollars to sell me something for twenty five which is a terrible fucking business model. Uh, but your retargeting ad set at the very end is gonna have like a 4X ROAS or something like that. And it's, that's a bullshit object, uh, number. And that's one of the reasons that the Scrum Doc is really helpful to see the entire ecosystem. Because it's not just about the profit margin of any one ad set or any one campaign. It's about your entire account as a whole. And if you don't understand that, then if you don't have a way of looking at that, then you're going to be making decisions which probably aren't the best. So to kind of wrap it all up, if anybody needs help with the Scrum Doc to fully understand these things, we're doing one-on-ones with those where we can just literally sit down and I'll build it for you, take an hour, and you can ask me all the questions in the world while we're doing it. And if you do the homework, you can get it for 50% off. So the homework for this week, make that ad engage a 365-day audience. Um, and if you enjoyed this or you find value in this or anything else, please join the Patreon for all the eBooks and the resources in there, of, like all the live feeds that we've done on this channel that's searchable. 
um, as well as a bunch of decks and stuff. And if you want more value, go to the Slack channel so that you can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. And there's a bunch of documentation and screenshots and stuff from all sorts of advertisers um, in there um, that they've decided you know to chat back and forth with. So it's a great resource. It's essentially like a mastermind group, but not some bullshit thing where you're overpaying to make friends that uh, also lie. A bunch of times um, it's just other advertisers trying to succeed and we've got some really really strong people in there um, I think courts coming back uh, especially if uh, he answers this thing and I can get him some work on Shopify uh, anyway so do that stuff and invite your friends if you had some if you enjoyed this but that uh, it's Saturday and um, if this helps I'm gonna try to do this again and it works for you you can make Dollar, dollar bills. Yay! No. <laughs>